Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. In the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. When Queen Elizabeth II died back in September of this year, the news stations began to show the obituary packages that they had prepared years, if not decades, in advance, showing video clips of important events from the late monarch's life. There were the weddings of her children, celebrations from her jubilee years, visits to all corners of the Commonwealth, and meetings with world leaders. But a clip that caught my eye was from her coronation. Her coronation, like that of 38 English monarchs before her, took place at Westminster Abbey. And like those coronations, it was a secular, but above all, a religious ceremony. But unlike those coronations, it was filmed by TV cameras for the first time. And the cameras missed nothing of the pomp and the pageantry. She had resplendent robes, a jewel-encrusted crown and orb, swords and scepters, a host of bishops and guards and lords, all surrounded the young queen as she began what would become a 70-year reign. But a subtle detail caught my eye as I took to YouTube to watch the full ceremony. 55 minutes into the three-hour ceremony, led by the Archbishop of Canterbury, the congregation sang the Nicene Creed. And at the name of Jesus, as the bishops all bowed their heads, as is customary, the queen stood off to the side and she curtsied. This woman who was becoming the sovereign of no less than 32 nations, spanning every time zone, to whom 200 million people would say, your majesty, and bow and curtsy to her, she curtsied. Kings and queens do not themselves bow or curtsy to anyone, but she did to this one person, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. She showed the sign of humility and respect. And that is because Jesus Christ is sovereign above all sovereigns, Lord above all lords, and the King of kings and queens. And that's what we commemorate today on this feast day of Christ the King. In this last day of the church year before we begin next year, a new season in Advent, we reflect on Christ's status as the one seated at the right hand of the Father where he rules over all creation. He's the one whom Jeremiah prophesied would come from the line of David and shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. He's the one whom Zechariah sang would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. And he is the one, as Paul wrote to the Colossians, to whom the Father delivered us from the power of darkness and into his kingdom where we receive forgiveness and redemption. You might then think today's gospel reading is an odd choice. Why do we hear the degradation and humiliation of Jesus, his crucifixion, being mocked by soldiers and bystanders and by a thief crucified next to him? Why don't we hear today of the visit from the three wise men who brought gifts becoming of a king? or of his glorious ascension into heaven after his resurrection? Why do we hear of the most horrific and lowest moment in his life? A moment which, if we let it move in our hearts, should grieve us deeply. But if we look closer at the details of what's going on, it's an entirely appropriate reading for today. We hear this account of his crucifixion because it is at this moment, upon the cross as he gave up his life for us, that Jesus, in the most unexpected and confounding way, is given his coronation ceremony. His crown was not one of gold and diamonds, but one of thorns. His throne is not a chair, but the hard wood of the cross. And there's no orb and scepter in his hands, but nails piercing his palms. To a bystander, this is the execution of a criminal. To those who know what's really going on, God in Jesus Christ, in the most radical act of sacrificial love, has changed the world forever. John the Baptist declared as Jesus began his ministry, repent, the kingdom of God is near. And at this moment upon the cross, as Jesus gives up his spirit, the kingdom is inaugurated. It's here, a new reign has begun, 
and not one that will last 70 years, but a reign without end. How do we know this? Listen to the words said by the criminal on the cross and Jesus' response. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replies, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. I'm aware that we're in a church that was once loyal to the crown, but generally as Americans we're allergic to kings and queens. We're not in the grand scheme of things that many generations removed from a bloody war where a tyrannical king was overthrown. So the idea of being in a kingdom might make us feel a little itchy. But in Jesus, we have a different kind of king and a different kind of kingdom. He's not like King George, one who subjugated his people, treated them harshly and extracted unfair levies. He's one who loves beyond measure, offers grace unbounded, and freely gave up his entire self for us. Nor is he like his ancestor, David, a king that stole a man's wife and then sent that man to face death on the battlefield. No, our king, King Jesus, fights battles on our behalf, defeating death, conquering sin, so that we might not be subjugated to either. And even a popular monarch like king, Queen Elizabeth II is not an adequate basis for comparison. For as much as she devoted her life in service of the Commonwealth, she could never begin to know even a fraction over the, of those over whom she reigned. The few who she did meet would maybe get a few seconds with her in a receiving line. Our King, King Jesus, knows each of us intimately. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows us and he loves us. We are not faceless courtesans in a receiving line. We are known and we are loved and we are forever in his company. So if the kingdom is here, where is it? And what does that mean for us? Many quite wrongly think the Christian vocation is to stay out of trouble, keep our noses clean, help others out a bit so one day in the future we might be invited into the kingdom. But that's not what's asked of us. We pray in the prayer that Jesus gave us that God's will be done on earth as in heaven. The kingdom is here, it's now, and it's breaking through. It's easy to dismiss this notion among the very real and terrible divisions in our society and the wider world. When we see war and famine and authoritarian regimes and the devastating effects of climate change, we might ask ourselves, where is this kingdom? But that question is the Christian vocation. Where is the kingdom? Where is God acting in the world? Where are people modeling the service and sacrifice of Christ? If we look at the world with this outlook, with kingdom-tinted spectacles, then suddenly we can see those signs everywhere. We saw it after 9-11, when people ran towards the towers and lined up around city blocks to give blood. We saw it earlier this year in Germany and Poland, when people crowded train stations to welcome ref Ukrainian refugees into their homes. And we see it here in this congregation, when one of us is in trouble and others show up to help. But the kingdom is also a work in progress. What began on the cross was just the start of God's great project to reclaim humanity from the powers and principalities that have corrupted it. And we, as followers of Jesus, have been recruited into that kingdom building project. Doing kingdom building work may sound daunting, and it would be if we had to do it alone. But just as on a large construction site or public work, building the kingdom requires a diversity of skills and gifts and vocations. But for us to put those to work, we need to put ourselves in the places where they are needed. We need to ask ourselves, who is already working for the good of king the kingdom and how can I help them? Is there a rural and migrant ministry or an inner change or a stand with Iraqi Christians? or a Tajman Relief, or a Phillipstown Food Pantry, already doing that work. And if there's no one doing the work, who can we find to partner with so that it gets done? 
But these acts don't have to be grand either. We all have a friend in trouble who needs a word, kind word, or a cup of coffee, and just our presence. It doesn't matter how grand the gesture is. It only matters that we are doing it, and we're doing it for the good of the kingdom. That we offer up ourselves in service of Jesus, our King. That we keep looking at the world, looking for signs of the kingdom breaking forth, and never forgetting that Jesus has remembered us, has invited us into the kingdom, and then one day we will be with him in paradise. Amen.